Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Q&A for the 20th century. My name is Chris Kumar and I'm the Programme Coordinator for Glasgow Film Festival and uh, I'm so delighted that you've all decided to take some time and uh, enjoy a wonderful film like the 20th century. We are delighted to welcome along uh, for the Q&A uh, the director of the 20th century and a wonderful Canadian man, uh, <laughs> Matthew Rankin. Hi, Matthew. How are you doing? I'm really great. Great to be with you, Chris. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, man. Like I said, we'll just kind of try to all stay safe and stuff. So, yeah, this is a good opportunity for us to keep people in the house and, you know, give them something to watch. So, yeah, 100%. man. Um, yeah, we were so delighted to show the 20th century um, in February at Glasgow Film Festival. It's such a wildly inventive and absurd but just enjoyable sort of thrill ride of a film and I'm just wondering if you can give us a little bit of background on how the film came to be. Sure so um, I guess when I was a university student uh, I learned that uh, Mackenzie King who was the Prime Minister of Canada for 22 years um, he was a lifelong bachelor and he had, he was a compulsive diarist and uh, I'm a, I'm a lifelong diarist myself. I've kept a diary for a long time. And, um, and I just had this sort of lurid thrill about reading someone else's diary. <laughs> so I, I went in and I started to read it and, um, um, and I, I just was sort of struck almost immediately by how much it resembled my own diary um, in, in, in all levels. Uh, it's, it's sort of maudlin outbursts, it's um, self-pity and passive aggression, and also uh, how boring it was, too. Uh, all of these are sort of qualities I associate with Canada itself. Um, and I would uh, usually fall asleep a little bit while I was reading it, and, uh, and then I'd wake up and I, I, I could never really be sure if what I had retained was something I actually read or, or if it was something I dreamed. Um, so at a certain point, I just forgot all about the diary and I started writing this thing. But it really began with a connection with this person and his kind of, um, uh, you know, his most melodramatic emotions. I think, and you know, yeah. I, I saw it as um, as a way of, sorry, yeah, yeah, oh, I, and yeah. I, 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 I guess I just, you know, the, my my thinking sort of morphed, and I just also saw it as a great opportunity to just take the piss out of Canada, you know. I mean, the movie is very much, you know, a lot of it seems like a piss take and is very much all in sort of jest. I think um, for those of us who aren't as well versed in the sort of life and times of Mackenzie King, which certainly I wasn't before I saw the film, um, the, the film definitely feels like in regards to the story, it's more of a sort of look at it has sort of chaotic mind more than it is really something to be taken at face value. I don't know if necessarily that's kind of what you aimed for, but it does seem like you're not trying to say that, you know, obviously it's a film, but you're not trying to say that this is, you know, through history facts or anything, it's, but it's a bit more of a commentary on what his mindset was a bit like. Oh, no. Yeah. That, that's right. I mean, it's um, it, certainly it is not um, a biopic <clears throat> in any kind of normal sense of that term. I describe it as a as a nightmare Mackenzie King might have had in like 1905. So it's, you know, and like our own nightmares, it's sort of processing uh, real lived experience and real people and real things that happen to him through a kind of oniric prism and, and sort of feeding feeding his own biographical information through his own pathologies and his imaginative universe. I really think of a diary as kind of like a parallel consciousness. It's not like really a nonfiction document. It's um, because, you know, it's our first way of processing the chaos of whatever we're going through. And so we're often seeing what we're recording through our own feelings and our emotional neediness and, uh, and often very reactive sort of uh, impulses and stuff. So it's, it's you know, it's this very, it, yeah, it's, it's like trying to, it's, it's sort of burrowing into his subconscious as a way of kind of burrowing into the Canadian subconscious. But you, you know, you don't really need to like check Wikipedia as you go along. It's, 
the, the, the film sort of contains what it is and, uh, you know, gives you the information you need. But you can check Wikipedia after, no problem. Yeah, well, I mean, I would very much like to read uh, his diaries now because um, he seems like a very, like, interesting character, shall we say. Um, just to move on as well, I think the performances as a whole in the film are great. The cast, by and large, are just, like, incredible. And I'm, I'm sure you probably have hours of bloopers because I can't imagine they got through every take first time because it's, you know, so absurd and funny at times, like... But um, in terms of the casting process, did you find that to be quite tough or was it very much a, an easy process for you? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it, uh, I, I wouldn't say that it was tough. There was, um, there was maybe one part we cast kind of late and that was Lord Muto, um, played by Sean Cullen. Uh, he came in sort of, he was sort of the last person to come in and we were, you know, had already kind of almost started shooting by that point. So maybe that was a little bit nerve wracking, but, but, um, but no, it all sort of came together. I mean, I, I cast a lot of my friends in it, which was nice. And, um, and uh, Dan Byrne, who plays the lead role as an actor, I've, a Canadian actor I followed quite closely for a number of years. I was a big fan of his work. And, um, you know, the, 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 the script is sort of particular. The language is somewhat mannered. And uh, so it was all about sort of, getting people to kind of enter this sort of uh, bizarre frequency that walked a fine line between irony and earnestness. And the idea was to sort of play everything straight. Um, but, but everybody got into that frequency so beautifully and, um, and it was really just, you know, a lot of fun. Uh, I really wanted to take kind of like a school play approach to the casting. I didn't want, um, you, know, uh, you know, like in a school play, you can have you know, your artful dodger who is neither cockney nor artful. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you can have your Captain Von Trapp. He doesn't need to be Swiss and he will be played by a child. So, you know, there's a little <laughs> suspension of disbelief involved. And, you know, so I was really trying to cast the right person kind of irrespective of their, their demographic profile. And there's a lot of intergender casting, which is kind of fun. And, and, um, and you know, this was also part of the conceit of the movie. It's kind of... Um, sort of challenging uh, structures of identity and um, trying to sort of subvert them. And so I really wanted it to be this sort of non-binary kind of open mode uh, uh, sort of approach to casting. Um, so yeah, but it, it, um, it was really fun. It was one of my favorite parts of the process was, was casting it. It's, uh, I really, really love cast. Cool. Um, just to move on as well to the sort of so throughout the film, many of the sort of places in Canada are depicted um, in a fairly, you know, quite out there fashion. Now, um, Winnipeg is now. I believe you are. You grew up in Winnipeg. That's um, right. Yeah. So Winnipeg, especially, is quite nightmarish. Um, I mean, and and places like Vancouver, it's all just you know trees chopped down and stuff. It's very very like sort of funny, but like. Was it all just meant to be a bit of fun or is it just, is it more, is there something more to that? Or did you just think oh, it's kind of fun to lampoon these places? Yeah, well, it, it's sort of, it's sort of playing with the idea of like uh, inner and outer identities. Uh, you know, the identity pr that we perform uh, and, and the dissonance with what might be within. Uh, and, and, you know, Canada's uh, perform one of the identities I think Canada certainly performs is is you know it's 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 natural world, and so I was trying to undermine this kind of you know uh, touristic chamber of commerce driven kind of uh, image of self uh, systematically by kind of <laughs> kind of um, I don't know uh, co confronting these images with the, the their worst possible uh, manifestation. So um, Winnipeg, in fact, has a, um, a public park which is known as Garbage Hill, and it's uh, formerly the town rubbish heap uh, over which um, you know grass had been laid, and now it's used for you know people go picnicking and uh, tobogganing and this kind of thing. Um, but but it is uh, it is a heap of garbage uh, upon which a park has been constructed and so I, I was kind of like my idea with Winnipeg was to sort of take that and uh, carve this sort of intestinal bowel -like 
you know, underground civilization in this hell of rubbish. Uh, that was that was sort of my thinking with that. But yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's all about sort of um, uh, you know playing around with um, uh, yeah the external and internal, sort of trying to get into the id uh, you know that is at the center of of all of these uh, expressions of identity. You know? Cool. And just on the topic of like how you you know we'll talk about the depiction of those places and how it looks. I mean, the actual aesthetic of the film and the costume design and. And the sets are just like marvelous to look at. I mean, how much of that was like, how much time did you really have to spend on getting that right? Because I, I can't, my, per, I'm not a filmmaker, so my personal, personally, my brain goes, how does someone make a film that looks like that? It's, it's quite majestic to look at. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I really great people who you know know how to do this stuff. Patricia McNeil did all the costumes and gowns. is just a genius. I worked with a brilliant art director, Danny Boivin, and a brilliant hair designer who's like a true artist, uh, Naomi Gilbich. And so uh, that that combo was you know really took it uh, like way over the top. Um, but prior to that, I did do a, an extremely elaborate storyboard and many, many, many conceptual drawings. And, um, and yeah, I was, uh, you know, and I did a little bit of a mood board and things like this. And, uh, but, you know, every shot was sort of uh, kind of, I drew it, I drew it all out first. And then we sort of, you know, extrapolated from there. But, um, you know, the, the, the kind of reigning conceit was to... Uh, Hey, what's that shop in the UK called where it's like everything costs a pound? Poundland. Poundland, that's right. Yes. So it's trying to take like a Poundland <laughs> approach to, to, to design. You know, it was like I, I had a tiny budget and I knew that I couldn't, you know, there's just no way that I could, you know, uh, you know, you, you know, if I could uh, try to approach the sort of Downton Abbey level of gloss, uh, I'd just fall flat on my face and fail within, you know, one morning. But I knew that if I took a more theatrical approach, I kind of embraced artifice, then I could, you know, uh, make this kind of Poundland 1899 Toronto and, I, and my budget would go much further, right? So, and that was also the kind of the conceit of the movie. Like I wanted, I wanted, you know, it's sort of about this nation building project in Canada. It's sort of a, in its earliest point. And, and I wanted the viewer to be constantly confronted by this idea that it's this artificial structure that's being grabbed upon the earth, right? So, so the natural world looks like, uh, um, you know, architectural uh, geometry, right? It's uh, it, it's about the the fakeness of this whole operation. Um, so so I, I'm a big believer that you know form should follow function. So uh, when when I felt like I you know had kind of uh, created a unity between the kind of thematic conceit and its visual expression, I thought okay I uh, th I you know I own this now. This 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 is a thing that you know makes sense. What well, um. What sort of influences did you draw from for this for when you were crafting the story? Because there's obviously a lot of humor in it, and and it's but it's also quite dark. And personally, myself, I grew up and I loved obviously uh, watching Kids in the Hall, which is obviously you know, like Canadian humor and stuff. And and uh, Monty Python is obviously a big one growing up. I was just wondering if what sort of comedic influences you have from your youth, and also more the more prevalent influences that you took going into making the film more recently yeah uh definitely uh yes monty python kids in the hall those would definitely be very important uh wizards for me uh, as i worked on this um definitely uh i think i would also say the films of carl zeman who himself was a huge influence on terry gilliam right Mm -hmm. uh, that, that he's really very important. Um, and I would also say where I grew up um, in Winnipeg, the filmmakers of Winnipeg, Guy Madden, obviously, it's a film that, you know, flies quite close to the, to the Madden sun. And, uh, but also John Pays, who was Guy Madden's mentor um, and made an incredible film called Crime Wave, which is yep. one of my favorite films. And um, 
and Richard Condy, who made one of my favorite short films, The Big Snit. Uh, it's amazing. Everyone should watch it. Um, that, uh, those, those three, and, and there's a real unity. I mean, they're all, you know, weirdos. And um, so those are big, big influences. I would say also that um, I was excited about, like, I'm really interested in, like, um, biographical films that um, kind of drive uh, the biographical details of a historical character into their own imaginative world. Um, and examples of that, I would consider like uh, Steven Soderbergh's Kafka, which is a film that was like universally panned when it came out. Even Soderbergh kind of um, disowns it, but it, it's, I think it's fantastic. It's driving, you know, Franz Kafka as, uh, you know, a historical figure into his own body of work. And David David Cronenberg's Naked Lunch has sort of a similar thing with Williams Burroughs and Naked Lunch, and I would say the Fellini Casanova also is uh, um, driving um, you know the details of Casanova's life into his imagined world. So that that is sort of the very tuning fork I used as I was working on this. I mean, it is about kind of driving Mackenzie King into his uh, into his own subconscious. And um, so. Obviously, unfortunately, just the way that, it, that lockdown is worked and stuff, we're not able to do this Q&A with an audience, which is a shame. But I did reach out to um, some people who had managed to see the, see the film at uh, the screenings in February. So I did manage to glean a few audience questions, we'll say, from there. So this one's from David Gattins, good old David Gattins, who actually works for Glasgow Film. So he, that's why it was easy to get a question from him. Um, his, his question is, I think it's a very Canadian film. Uh, two Canadians that were sitting next to him laughed louder than anyone else in the uh, screening. <laughs> um, were you ever worried that the film might be, how it might be received and understood out with Canada? Sure. There, there definitely is a string of in-jokes that, you know, Canadians will, you know, uh, get more than anybody else. But, um, and I, yeah, I did think about that. Certainly I did. Um, however, I, I sort of feel in a, in a weird way that, you know, reactions to the film have been strangely universal, even in Canada. I mean, this is not, you know, sure it is about Canada, but this is a Canada on Mars, right? It's like, um, it, it's, it's, it's a completely redefined parallel universe. And even Canadian audiences are kind of discovering it and learning about it as everyone is. Um, I think, I don't know, I mean, I, I personally think that like one of the greatest pleasures of cinema is entering another world that you don't necessarily know about. And, um, you know, um, and, and if, it, if it's precise and well-defined, uh, you know, you can see something uh, that can excite you in it. I mean, think about how much we know about Brooklyn because of, of American cinema, right? We know so much about Brooklyn because of American films we've consumed. Uh, I knew so much about Brooklyn before I ever visited Brooklyn. So, you know, there's stuff like that. You know, similarly, like I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Iranian cinema. And this was very much my like, you know, entry point to Iran. It's, it's uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the discovery of other worlds, uh, other, you know, uh, uh, contexts, well-defined, um, the, the, you know, there's, there's a way in, you know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I personally, that's what I love about cinema is, is precisely, is precisely that. So, you know, it's, um, um, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a fear that I think Canadians have much more than um, elsewhere in the world. It's like, you know, um, I, I feel like that's a question that Canadians have asked much more than international audiences have <laughs> typically, but um but yeah, I don't know. It's sort of, it's you know, sort of one of one of those things. It, you know, it is what it is. But it's uh, there's a way in. You know. Yeah, I think um, I think uh, world of cinema. That's the best thing about cinema as a whole is you get to experience different places through the the medium of film, and that's why I love working for film festival, especially because you get to bring these films to show it to audiences, don't get a chance to see these things as much. So um, yeah, it's just been so amazing um, to obviously have something like this, which I just adore personally. Um, 
So yeah, I think we're just just sort of kind of winding down now. Um, what is next for you? Any projects in the pipeline, or are you just going to spend your lockdown, you know, staring in the middle of the distance? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm um, I'm working on a, a number of things. I'm working on a children's show, um, <laughs> which might be for children. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm working on a, a couple of other things. I mean, it's, I'm really fortunate just to be writing uh, stuff right now. Uh, all of my friends trying to shoot things are, are really in trouble. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm just sort of burrowing into the uh, COVID winter and uh, writing, writing the next thing. So yeah, I'm okay. Feeling all right. Good. Hopefully the, um, hopefully the, ch the child's uh, TV show won't feature the cactus. I think that will probably be uh, maybe maybe keep that for the adults, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no. The the the, the cactus society of um, Manitoba has already lodged a complaint, and I'm not allowed to uh, represent cacti anymore in in summer. <laughs> oh man. Well, um, I think um, not to take up too much more of your time. Man, it's been an absolute delight chatting to you. Um, as I say, I love the film. I'm sure everyone that tuned in to stream the film has has certainly taken something from it. At least that's my main hope. Um, and yeah, if the, I just want to leave the floor to you just before we finish up. Is there anything you'd like to say to the Glasgow film audience, the UK as a whole, um, who have tuned in, or just anything that you just want to sign off on? Thanks for not changing the channel. <laughs> I think I think I don't. Uh, so um, I'd just like to say thank you everybody that's tuned in and stuck around to watch the Q&A and, and has paid money to watch the film. Um, I know uh, Matthew really appreciates it and, and everyone at Glasgow Film Festival really appreciates it too. So um, please have a good night um, or day or whenever you've watched the film. <laughs> and yeah, stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>